Hey, Dental Nachos crew, it is Paul Dr. Nacho with another episode of Spicy Topping. So excited to talk to Dr. Nate Chiel. Before we find out all about him and all the cool things he does, I'm a big one thing guy, Nate. And one of my goals in life, uh, my goals in life is to do this less, to cry less on the inside as a dentist. One of the ways mm. that you can do that is increase case acceptance systems. So if you were just, people are tuned in for like one minute, what's one thing you would tell a dentist to do in 2020 to decrease the amount of times they feel like crying inside throughout their day? Yeah, so here it is. Make sure that you are selling to buyers and not trying to chase down the non-buyers. That's the, the quickest route to happiness is by making sure you're talking to the right people. I, I, I love that. Uh, really digestible, like to use a nacho term, uh, menu. And now I want to dig into more about what you do. So one yeah. of the things I say with my team, you know, I, we both do a lot of the same stuff. I'm practice dentist dentistry, brokering, speaking. So sometimes I say, I don't even know what room I'm in and what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to orient my mind. So orient yeah. our viewers. What are you doing in this dentisting world? How do you help dentists? Tell us a little bit about your life. Yeah, cool. No, well, thanks for the question. I'm glad to be here. It's, uh, I've been watching you for a while, and so I'm glad we get this chance to, you. You know, to talk to everybody live here. It's really awesome. Now, I mean, like you, I'm a dentist. I do practice, albeit on a somewhat modified uh, schedule that I could tell you about. Um, I'm currently on practice number six. And so wow. my wife and I were dental school classmates. We teamed up um, about a year out of school, and we just kind of went on a bit of a shopping spree, and we picked up five practices in a short period of time. Of course, when you do that and you don't have a ton of experience, you're bound to make a lot of mistakes. Sure. So we went, you know, right into the deep end with uh, with no flippers, no uh, what do you call them? No uh, yeah, yeah no floaties. floaties. Yeah, yeah. So my 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 two year old use. Yeah, exactly. So we kind of we jumped in, hit fast forward, and um, and accomplished a whole bunch of learning in a relatively short period of time. So it was wonderful in the sense that we picked up um, as a result of making mistakes. We picked up a lot of experience and a lot of uh, understanding of how the industry works and then after a period of time we kind of consolidated some of our better people um, into a smaller number of practices um, got bored and then we opened up a brand new one last year so um, awesome. last year, it's seven how many locations do you have total um, well the one that we opened last year was number six that we've ever had at, at present time I actually have three Nice. Now, I, I like, you know, I have an awesome opportunity I connected with Dr. Mark Costas my friends and you might know him already you know I've lectured at the Dental Success Summit. People want it. People say, I want to own more than one practice, right? But A, it's not always all it's cracked up to be. And B, very few dentists mm -hmm. even own more than one practice. So what do you think the skill right. is, the need to be a multi-practice owner? You know, what are the things like, you know, the non-clinical skill? What is maybe the nacho ordinary dental thing that allows you to be able to manage multiple practices at the same time? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in my experience, it's really a decision that has to be made. And that is... Do you, I mean, if you want to do dentistry five days a week, then I think that going into a multi-practice situation is perhaps not the best situation. Um, for, for myself, I had um, interest in a number of different areas. And so sure, clinical dentistry was of interest to me, but I was also really captivated by uh, learning and understanding more about business and developing that acumen. And so having the opportunity to do that via the acquisition of practices over time, that's something that really just, it allowed me to indulge a passion. So I wouldn't say that someone should do it if they think that it's a, a shortcut to riches, because I can assure you it's not. Yeah. I mean, I, I joke that we used to have to, my wife and I, we would go to, we'd go to Vegas every couple of weeks just to get some peace and quiet. Yeah, that's yeah how, exactly. That's like it was at home, right? So, um, I mean, I'd say don't, don't do the money, do it if it's something that you're passionate about. And if you enjoy leadership, if you want to learn more about how to be a, a CEO and how to focus on, we call I me mean, 2020 has been this year, everyone's been talking about PPE, right? Personal protective equipment. Well, I have, a, I have another, um, another acronym. What we call it is building practices that are predictable, profitable, and enjoyable. So that's what he means to me in 2020. And so you can go look at a multi-practice situation if you want to, if you just love the leadership, you love the culture building, the team building. And if you want to build businesses that are predictable, profitable, and if you can find a way to enjoy it, then yeah, then perhaps it is for you. But if your focus is on clinical dentistry and you want to be the implant guy, then be the implant guy. You know, but I, I think- I love that insight. And also I'll share as someone who's owned multiple practices. And I've also brought a lot of different practice cultures and generations together. To me, it could just be bit broken down. And what you shared was awesome. Uh, first of all, yes, it's not a road to riches, uh, owning multiple practices, because there's a, there's a significant financial cost, but you get a certain amount of freedom in what you can do when you can replace yourself, someone doing class two. What I would say is, 
if you have to want to work with dentists and patients, right? A solo practice owner works with patients and their team. A multiple practice owner is working with dentists, patients, and team. So are you the type of person that want to work That's with right. dentists? Because in Philadelphia, hopefully you come after the pandemic, there's a great uh, restaurant tour, Stephen Starr, who's had to shut down some of his restaurants during the pandemic. He has successful ones in Philly. So he's got to want to work with chefs. You know, he's got to get multiple chefs in there. So yeah. I would say that the dentist is like the chef and finding chefs to work with can be challenging. So appreciate you sharing that very much. Um, mm -hmm. I want to switch gears a little bit because one of the reasons we got together uh, is because your awesome wife said, hey, you talk a lot about patient communication. Nate talks about it. Uh, share with us, you know, what's drawn you into, and Christopher Phelps was on saying, you're awesome at doing this. He's one of my friends, you know, he talks about this. I have this guy here when I said, this is your success in dentistry, right? Don't be impressed with my drawing. It's your core. You have to be able to make decisions with your mind. Uh, you have to say words to patients in your hands. And dental school talks a lot about your hands, but the Krebs cycle has got me out of zero jams in the real world, but my <laughs> words have. So share with us a little bit about your dental core and, you know, your passion for helping dentists learn how to talk to patients and also treat the patients they want to see. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Let me first say that I, I uh, really have great admiration and respect for, uh, for Chris Phelps. He's a fantastic guy, great dentist, but a great teacher as well. Um, now, in, in terms of what, what I do, we've really perfected an approach to patient communication that helps us to be able to start an inordinate number of people into uh, treatment, into dental solutions that are really, really meaningful. And for me, this has just been transformative in the way that I practice because I've stopped dealing with people who really don't want what I have yeah. and almost entirely deal with people who only want what I have. And so that makes my days easy. It makes them fun. I'm dealing with people who show up, pay their bill, and can't wait to get the result. So first of all, that, that's transformative in and of itself. But the process that we follow to get there is one that really focuses on communications, it completely divorces, um, the, the, the process is completely divorced from any concepts around patient education, anything like that. I tell doctors all the time, if, if there's one thing I can tell you, that is don't wear your educator cap into the operatory. Right. Because what you're gonna do is confuse people and confused people don't buy anything. For so sure. if you're wanting to improve your case acceptance, don't try to educate, don't talk about technical things. Um, last week I actually had a young dentist who came in and he shadowed me for the day and he kept saying, he's like, wow, I can't believe that you don't talk about anything technical. Now this is entirely by design. There is, there's, there's no need to talk about anything technical because really what we're doing is we're walking through people through a process of self-realization. So we're helping them to articulate what it is that they're suffering from. We're then gaining their emotional buy-in with a series of carefully thought out questions, right? So we help them understand what's going on in their words. We use those words then to help them to, um, to buy in emotionally to a solution. We gain their commitment and then we do a perfect handoff. And it's actually quite simple when you put all of that together. But the problem is, uh, you know, a lot of dentists that I'm talking to, they're missing out on some of these big things. They're not getting the emotional buy in. So they're doing the educator thing and said, um, instead of that, they're not gaining commitment, which if you don't gain commitment, as soon as you walk out of the room, you know what happens. I mean, they, they right. probably don't point and they don't pay for anything. Yeah, um, so exactly. we've got to get this emotional buy-in. It's really critical. We've got to gain the commitment and we have to make sure that there's a clear, a clear next step and a clear next responsible person in line to make sure that the person who's come to your office, trusting in your skills and ability to help them solve the problem, make sure they don't leave empty handed. I mean, I love all that. I mean, I, it's some of the things I embrace. My team's probably thinking, you know, you're like a Canadian, a better Canadian version than me. Better beard, better hair, better everything. So, you know, you can, you can, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, mine is not nearly as good, but I am the same way. And it, the way I do it, probably do it, it's so threatening to dentists that sometimes they get upset. They say, you talk to patients like they're babies or four years. I said, yeah, I talked to, because that's how you want to learn about your car. I mean, Seinfeld's one of my favorite shows, and there's a classic episode where the mechanic gives all these technical terms, and Seinfeld's like, I just want to drive the car away. And it's, we are taught in a way that inhibits our success to talk to patients like they're other dentists instead right. of people. And it's it, yep. until you, and you know, I, I want to give a free giveaway. If you text in Nate to 215-543-6454, uh, we'll send you one of our Tough Conversation CE courses. So I love this conversation, Nate, but and I love all about patient communication, but go back a little. How do you, I'd like to go out to, out to dinner with people who only ever want to get nachos, right? You know, they want, my wife said, you want to get Indian or sushi. I said, what about nachos? So it sounds like you've created a practice where you find these, that version of those patients. How do people do that? Or how can you help them do that? Because it sounds like a really, a much less stressful way to practice dentistry. 
Well, it certainly is. Now, I mean, combine that with my work schedule, which is really a 26 week a year schedule. So I alternate clinical and non-clinical weeks, which gives me an additional layer of, of freedom and insulation from some of the headaches. So I, I mean, I advise that if anyone's willing to take the yeah. plunge, do it. It's probably one of the best things that I ever did. Um, now to answer your question, it's kind of a, it's a two part thing. So we have the external marketing on the one hand, where we carefully selected an audience, we carefully crafted the message, and we selected the platform wisely in order to be able to reach the people who are suffering with the problem we want to solve. So that's the first part. And the second part is we've really focused on the in-office experience and making sure that we are quickly understanding who's a buyer and who's not. And the really easy way to determine that is, it's a simple question, is this a problem that they can see themselves continue to live with or is it not? In other words, do they care or do they not? If they don't care, you can talk all day long, they're not buying. Sure. But if they do care, then it's a really, really easy transition from where the patient is today and getting them into treatment that solves their problem. So it's really all about their, their internal motivation. We can't motivate them. They're either motivated or not. For sure. We've got questions to ask to find out if they're motivated because if they are, then we pursue that hard. But if they're not, we just let them go. No, I mean, no sweat. And I so it really- I, I love that. I mean, also, I think it's just, we're all people, you know, dental notches is about bringing your person self first, your dental self second, whether you're a rep, a student. And it's even when you walk around, I mean, there's many people who should go to a gym, but they don't. There's many people who should save for retirement, but they don't. Maybe we're one of those people at different phases of our life. So instead of being so judgmental, it's better to right. just find out who fits into your system now. Dr. John Coy's person I love, got a chance to lecture with him one time. And I will never forget in 2005, he said, everybody in my office must read the book called Raving Fans before they work for me. And Raving Fans is a very short, easy book to read. Uh, it's funny because, you know, it talks about cab drivers. We don't have that as much anymore, but it just talks about you don't have to be everything to everybody, but dental school teaches us the That's exact right. opposite of what right. will make you successful. I always say, if you try to be a general dentist that runs a diner and do 47 menu items, that will be exhausting. And that if you just look to your specialist colleagues who often seem happier less stressed and making more money, it's because of what mm -hmm. you have said. They are doing a lot of these one or two things. Um, it brings me up to this topic. Nate, you, you do a lot with clear aligners. I know that's something patients, de dentists would love to add to their practice. What's been your journey like that with that part of your career? Yeah, well, I mean, clear aligners, um, Invisalign in particular, has really big, become a, a significant part of uh, our practices. Um, this started about five years ago. Um, since then, I've done several hundred cases. Um, now we're on pace for uh, well over 100 this calendar year. Um, and considering my work schedule, I think it's, it's a fairly decent number. In fact, um, in the month of September, we started 20 cases in a single day. So we had a, a six-figure day in the office, and it was only on Invisalign. Um, and so this was kind of putting some of these principles into play. I talked about your external ads. I talked about the experience inside of the office. These principles were put into action to be able to do a $100,000 day um, in the single dental office, and that was with Invisalign alone. Um, I love it. It's a, it's a tool, of course, and it's only as good um, as the hands of the person who's using the tool. But um, it's something I really like because, for one reason, because my patients value the solution that we're providing. So um, it allows me to have great relationships with people because we're solving a problem that has been on their mind forever. We're solving a problem that keeps them up at night, something they've been thinking sure. about can't wait to solve. I get to be the person who helps them through that. So for me, it's very gratifying professionally, but also in terms of relationships, it's great because like I said, they show up, they pay their bill, um, they, don't, they don't skip out and they're, and, and they're just internally motivated to get the result, which transforms the way that I practice and the way that I even think about going into work every day because I know that I'm meeting with good people uh, almost exclusively. I, I, that's such an important message for whether you're a student watching this or dentist midway through their career. You know, I had a, a show the other day, one of my close friends growing up, amazing entrepreneur, he started a chocolate company in Africa, being to bar, socially conscious company. And he was on, I said, man, my, one of my best friends, he decided to sell chocolate. I did dentistry, probably should have chose chocolate because people love that. No one likes dentistry. I was making a joke, but that's why things like clear aligners and dental implants they're wins, right? Very few people jump up from the chair, and by very few, I mean none, and thank you for a class two composite, right? So right. With Invisalign or clear aligners or implants is an opportunity to share something like that's the chocolate, especially clear aligners. They might brag to their friends, someone might give them a compliment, and during this crazy mm -hmm. pandemic time, there's an, I see that this opportunity. One of my other close friends is a, a contractor, and I said, how are things going? He goes, I've never been busier because all these people are in their homes. They say, I might as well do the project. I can't travel. 
if I was spending $50,000 to travel, I might as well just do something in my bathroom. And maybe dentistry can learn from that and say, maybe people will straighten their teeth now. I mean, there was, I saw, I'm, I'm going to steal this because it's not my idea, but I saw someone, an ad with, you know, there, never a better time to do ortho because everyone's wearing masks all the time. Right. Right? I thought that was a creative strategy. So if, if you were a dentist saying, I want to add this, I'm a big, my first, my first practice sale, my first implant. How would you recommend someone get involved in learning about doing clear aligners? Well, you know what, I'm, I'm a key opinion leader, as it turns out, for an organization called the American Academy of Clear Aligners. Um, that's really where I got um, my, my start beyond the initial, you know, uh, Invisalign certification course. But beyond that, um, getting involved with the American Academy of Clear Aligners, the AACA, has been really transformative. Not only are there great people there, but there is a continuing education program that will get someone who is, you know, taking the initial few steps toward provide, you know, becoming a, a provider and help them get to a place where they're really comfortable um, on the clinical side of things. Um, beyond that, though, beyond the, you know, the basics of doing clinical dentistry, like in any of the sub-disciplines, you know, you do it a bunch of times and you'll inevitably get pretty right. good at it. I find what really makes the difference, though, is focusing next then on the communications like we're talking about. And that's really where I found my, my calling. Um, and not only am I in a position now to be able to help other dentists, but I also continue to invest in, in, in training, mentorship, and coaching for myself to, you know, as I continue along this journey, too. Um, it's just been a really you know, a, a great experience. So um, if, if someone's looking at aligners, get the basics down, sure, and then start focusing on how do we, how do we develop a conversational framework that guides people to the only logical conclusion, which is that you're the provider of choice to solve the problem that they have. Yeah, I, I love that. And you said something really important that I would like to, you know, point out as a golden nacho, which is what I say is it's like coaches should have coaches just like athletes. And if you're working with someone who says, I don't do any coaching or improving myself, that's a red flag. We're all trying to learn. I would never say I've mastered parenting. There's no way I could get better. So everyone's trying to improve along their journey. And we see PGA Tour professional golfers giving each other tips on the driving range and the putting green. And for some reason, Dennis say, oh, if this consultant doesn't do every single one of these things, we're all on this journey and where we are in the journey, we can help each other. And in fact, I do teach a lot like you. Oftentimes, you're most, you hear it the best from someone maybe just one or two notches above you as opposed to 50 notches. Because if Tiger Woods came and tried to give somebody golf instruction who hasn't played, it's really right. a hard mess there. So it's just to have some great understanding of that. So I love all that, Nate. You've been a great uh, guest here on um, Spicy Toppings, Improving Your Dentist Core. I always like to give uh, my guests an opportunity to share anything they'd like about themselves. Uh, we have a text, a special text code for Nate. But if someone's watching this now or when it gets 9 million hits on YouTube, which should be tomorrow, Nate, um, mm -hmm. uh, how can they reach out to you to learn more about what you do? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, I post every single day on Instagram. A lot of times it's a video. Sometimes it's, you know, some kind of photo and, and um, ways of, of sharing a lot of the concepts that, uh, that we're working on all the time here. So check me out on Instagram. You can find awesome. me. It's at Dr. Nate Jill. If you want to look at what we're doing with our dental practice, our latest one on Instagram, it's at 204smile.co. And you'll see on there, there's a ton of content. And really, we made a decision during COVID. I said, listen, do I want to be a consumer of content or do I want to be a creator? And it was an easy decision to make. And we sit on this path of creating an over a number of months now, have put out daily, I mean, like every single day, new pieces of content. Um, mine, of course, is a little bit different than dental practice stuff, but I can tell you that now, six months into that um, consistent effort, we are getting multiple people every single week who are reaching out directly, looking for solutions to problems that they're genuinely suffering with. And so that consistency is a big thing. So check out those two Instagram feeds there. Um, you can link to my wife's as well, because she has a fantastic one. If there are um, any ladies out there, or even men who just want to see a, a female perspective, you can check that out too. Really, really cool stuff. Otherwise, I do have, I mean, Paul, I understand you've got a course on case acceptance. I've got one too. I'd love awesome. to yeah, share that. Talk way to share that and I'd be happy to be generous. We We'd love that. Out. Yeah. I, I think that's so great. I mean, we need more of that. We need, you know, it's, it's like, it's another thing where someone says, you don't have one pair of sneakers. You don't have one training thing. You need multiple voices helping you just to be the best version of yourself. You know, no competition to someone else. But, you know, sometimes what I find very valuable, you know, Hamilton is one of our favorite plays in our house. They mm -hmm. practice that every single day to get it good. 
get good at it. Somehow people say, I already took a course on case acceptance. I'm like, well, take more courses, take more courses on occlusion. That's right. Because the more you hear these words and say the words, the more it can come out on stage when you're with your patient. And it's not like I never bumble anything with patient communication, but I've just done it so many times and used to objections and overcoming them. So we'll get that course for me, Nate. Thanks for being a guest on the show and we'll have you back. Yes, I'd love to be back and thank you.